Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11, verse 29, uh, this morning. Jesus is calling out the Pharisees, the lawyers, and he gives them warnings, woeful warnings. There's four woes in this uh, section of scripture. Jesus is loving us enough to speak the truth to us, to challenge us this morning. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you do love us enough to speak truth to us. And we don't want to just simply check the box of being at church or going through the motions of, of giving, but truly be in a close relationship with you. We thank you that you desire a close uh, relationship with us. And so give us ears to hear, hearts to understand. Would you send your spirit to lead us and guide us in truth? Jesus, would you be glorified in your name? Amen. The Pharisees, rightfully so, get picked on a lot because they're so far off at the time of Jesus. But it's good to note and remember that they started off well. The word Pharisee means set apart once. Their hearts had been touched by God and they said, we want to follow God. We want to be set apart from him. But over time, they moved away from a relationship with God really into legalism and adding rules that were above and beyond what the Lord had said in his word. And we'll find in our study this morning that they had completely missed the point. I think it's a good warning for us as well because we could fall into the same trap of the Pharisees. Where the Pharisees went off, I think, is where we'll tend to go off as well. It's the struggle that all of us are going to have in and of our own flesh. Uh, Kent Hughes is a great commentator, and he wrote a a, a great teaching on this uh, section and calls it woeful warnings. There's four warnings in this, so I want to give him credit for his work this morning as we'll be looking at those uh, four major points. In verse 29, and while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Jesus is not impressed with this crowd that has gathered. It's gathered to the point where it's thick, meaning it's hard to get through. You're just packed in people. Maybe you've been at a concert or a 4th of July gathering, and it's just shoulder-to-shoulder people. And that's the case, and they're all coming out to hear Jesus But Jesus is not impressed. He calls them an evil generation, and it's because they're seeking a sign. At this point in Christ's ministry, he's done a lot of signs, but yet they're not trusting and believing in Jesus. Even though Christ has their attention, they haven't been willing to commit themselves to Christ. He says the only sign that he's going to give is the sign of Jonah the prophet. Now that might seem a little bit and cryptic, but what does that mean? Some of you may not be familiar with the prophet Jonah. He is the reluctant, rebellious prophet. God calls him to the Ninevites, to the city of Nineveh, to preach to them a message of repentance. What does Jonah do? He becomes non-prophet. He puts in his resignation to the Lord, goes the opposite direction, gets on a boat, goes to Tarsus. God confronts him with a storm. The crew begins to throw things overboard to try to save the ship. And Jonah's like, I'm the problem. Just go ahead and throw me overboard. That would be a good time for repentance, don't you think? Like, I think I'm going to get right with the Lord. Jonah's like, nope, I'd rather die. I do not want to go to Nineveh. The reason why is the Ninevites were Assyrians and the enemies of Israel and had brutalized Israel, and he knew that God was merciful, and he didn't want to see them forgiven. God didn't give up on Jonah and prepared a great fish to swallow him up. I'm blown away that the crew threw him in. The crew's like, okay, you want to go? You're the problem? Get out of here, right? Here comes this great fish that swallows him up. And the scripture tells us that he was in the belly of this fish for three days and three nights. And this is where it points to Christ. How long was Christ buried? Not in the belly of the fish, but in the tomb, three days, three nights. Jonah gets right with the Lord. He waits three days to get right with the Lord. Not very nice living conditions, I would imagine, inside of this great fish. Disgusting. As he repents, then the fish has an urge to regurge. (laughs) Barfs up Jonah 
Jonah comes into Nineveh with a bad attitude and says, repent, and it's maybe one of the greatest revivals in human history. This pagan city repents and gets right with the Lord. Then Jonah goes outside the city and pouts that God has forgiven them, right? How does this tie into Jesus Christ's resurrection? The resurrection of Christ is the ultimate sign. Jesus is saying, if you're not going to trust the resurrection, then what are you going to trust? He predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection. To this day, the resurrection is proof that Christ is who he says he is. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Jonah was the sign to Nineveh. Jesus, the Son of Man, God in human flesh, is the sign to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in judgment with men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. We know from the Old Testament, this is the Queen of Sheba. She comes from the region of Ethiopia, travels all the way to Jerusalem, simply because she heard of the wisdom of Solomon. And Jesus says, the Queen of Sheba was willing to travel, sacrifice, and listen to Solomon. I'm here, the Son of Man, and you're not listening to me. The Queen of Sheba is going to rise up in judgment against you. Don't miss that Jesus is greater than Solomon. Solomon was one of the greatest kings of Israel. At his time, he had tremendous amount of wisdom. He wrote the book of Proverbs. But obviously, his heart got off track towards the end of his life. He married all of these women from pagan nations and went into idolatry. Jesus is the greater than Solomon. In verse 32, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The Ninevites are like, we listened to Jonah, and he was kind of a half-hearted messenger with a bad attitude. Why didn't you listen to Jesus? This is God in human flesh. He died and, and rose again, but yet you rejected them. So even though the crowds would rally to hear Jesus, not many repented and followed him. Not many believed him. He was, he was largely rejected. This next section is really important. Before Jesus begins to talk to the Pharisees and the lawyers, he gives us this illustration of the eye. And it's ultimately pointing to the hard heart of the Pharisees. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. You know, some tech is pretty fun, isn't it? Like, let's talk about flashlights for a little bit. I go back to my childhood with flashlights, and they, they were huge with big batteries, and the light wasn't that very good, not, not that great. You take a flashlight out hunting, and man, it's like a dinosaur. Someone came up with the idea for a flashlight to be on your head with a small little LED light that's so powerful and a few batteries. And when those first came out, they're really expensive. Now you can pick them up for, for 20 bucks. And we're out hunting with these headlamps on our head, and it's, it's amazing. Flashlights have come a long ways. No point in that. Just wanted to share about flashlights. <laughs> No, if, if you get a headlamp, why do you get a headlamp? To, to provide light. You know, when we use our headlamps for hunting in the morning and the evening, we're not going to take those headlamps and stuff them down in our backpack. I mean, I'm going to light this and then put this down in my backpack. No, the whole purpose is, is for light. Jesus here is referring to himself. He is the light of the world. And as he's the light of the world, what's the problem with this generation? Why aren't they trusting him? Why aren't they responding to him? What's the problem with the Pharisees and the lawyers? Why aren't they responding to Jesus? The problem is not with Christ. The problem is with their hearts. In verse 34, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. When your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. So Jesus uses our physical eye. If your eyes are good... You see light, and your whole being benefits from being able to see. Amen? Agreed? Right? But if your eyes are bad and you're blind, your world is dark. 
And the same's true with our hearts. Spiritually, what causes us to see is our hearts. And when our hearts are soft, when our hearts are right with the Lord, then the love of Jesus Christ comes into our life and penetrates us and, and transforms us. In verse 35, therefore take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Well, what does that mean? In context of the Pharisees, the lawyers, they thought that they were in the light. If you were to ask them, are you right with God? Oh, absolutely, I'm, I'm right with God. But in reality, their light was darkness. They're rejecting Jesus. They're even plotting to, to kill Jesus. I don't know if there's ever been a time in your life where you thought that you were in the light, but then you look back and you go, I wasn't in the light. I was actually in a place of pride. I was trusting in myself. I, I wasn't looking to Jesus. I got off track. And what caused the Pharisees and the lawyers to get off track was actually religion, was actually legalism, was actually being committed to morality outside of a, a relationship with Christ. And that can be almost a more deceptive way to get off track. I wonder how many moral people will go to hell. They go, man, I'm moral. I'm a good person. You know, I'm not a person that's done this, 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 this. And, they, and I go to church and I try to do good by, by others. And they've never seen their need for, for a savior. The Pharisees were those ones that didn't realize their own sin, their own spiritual sickness. And if you're sick, why are, if you don't realize you're sick, why are you going to need a physician? If we don't realize we're sinners, we're not going to need a, a savior. In verse 36, if then your whole body is full of light, have no part dark. The whole body will be full of light as when the light shining of a lamp gives you light. On the flip side, when your heart is right, that's your spiritual eye, then your being is impacted with light. This is why God tells us to tend to our heart. In Proverbs 4, it says to keep your heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. Pay attention to, to your heart. Remember the parable of the sower? There was four different types of soil representing the heart. The seed was good, but what if my heart is hard? So where's my heart with the Lord? Continuing going to the Lord with those heart checks and being open to what he would speak to us. And as he spoke, so Jesus is saying these words about the spiritual eye. A certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. Kind of surprising that Jesus would take this invitation. He knows the heart of the, the Pharisee, but he's willing to do it. That's Christ. He'll take the invitation. If you say, hey, come spend time with me, he's going to come and spend time with you. And at times, he will speak the truth to us. So he's having a meal with the Pharisee. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he did not first wash before dinner. The Pharisees offended that Jesus didn't wash his hands before eating. What's this all about? In Leviticus, the priests were told to wash their hands ceremonially before they ate. Before long, they implied that to everybody. This wasn't an issue of hygiene. This was an issue of being right with God. This is where they added to the word of God. If you need to be right with the Lord, you need to properly wash your hands before you have a meal. I'd be in trouble. Even after COVID, I'd still be in trouble. Should probably wash my hands more before I eat, right? Jesus here, in a sense, is taking on a confrontation with the Pharisee. He knows exactly what this is going to do to the Pharisee. The Pharisee is going to be offended that Jesus doesn't wash his hands before he eats. Christ is setting the stage for this conversation. In verse 39, Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisee, make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? The Pharisees made this mistake of just focusing on cleaning up the exterior, just cleaning up 
the outside. And Christ gives this analogy of you've got a cup. Let's say I have my favorite coffee mug up here this morning. And I just spend time cleaning the outside. And the outside looks so polished and perfect. And you would assume, well, man, Eric really takes care of that cup. The the inside must be clean as well. You ask to borrow it, and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll share my favorite cup with you. And you look inside, and I have left coffee inside of that coffee mug for six months, you say. Have you noticed if if there's like maybe a quarter cup left in there and you just leave it for a long period of time? It actually grows mold. It really does. And it gets, gets disgusting. You're like, what's wrong with this guy? Like clean the inside of the mug. It's fine to clean the outside of the mug. But what really matters is the inside. And what matters to the Lord? It's the inside. Part of what the Pharisees overemphasized was what you would eat. And I'm Got to make sure that I don't accidentally eat a gnat because that could make me unclean. And in Matthew 15, Jesus says, Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart perceive evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Religion, legalism... It's all going to tend to focus on the exterior, what people can see. We want people to think well of us, and so we take all of this time to go, well, how am I appearing to others? And we can neglect the heart. We can neglect really what's going on on the inside. And Jesus, thankfully, can change and transform the heart. When we're honest with him about the greed, the lust, the anger, the bitterness, the covetousness, and confess that to the Lord. He's able to forgive. He's able to cleanse. He's able to give us the the power to change. But that's where we meet with the Lord is, is what's really going on the inside. We can fool people, can't we? We can play this game just like the Pharisees, but we can't fool the Lord. What I think happened to the Pharisees over time is they got self deceived because they were to able to scrub up the outside, they assumed that the heart was good. And they stopped being convicted about what was going on in their heart. Verse 41, but rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. Jesus is pointing out as, as you give and, and you share, then that impacts your, your whole entire being. He goes deeper into this issue of giving But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. If you're taking notes, the first woe, but woe to you Pharisees, is woeful giving. Woeful giving. Jesus is saying giving is good, but your giving has gotten off track You're tithing on your mint. I don't know if you've ever had a mint plant or grown mint in your your garden. It's like a weed. It will take over and you will have tons of mint. Imagine being out in your backyard with all of this mint going, I got to make sure to give 10% to the work of the Lord. I'm going through my cilantro. (laughs) Got to make sure to give the cilantro to the Lord. And Jesus like, that's good and fine. It's not wrong for you to tithe on your your mint mint and your herbs, but you've missed something. You, you've passed by justice and the love of God. They're majoring on the minors, right? And the minor things have become the majors. They're no longer concerned with justice and love for God. I think it's important for us to understand justice from a biblical perspective, Justice from a biblical perspective is for evil to be held in check. Justice is not socialism. There's a lot today that will use the phrase social justice. And when you look at that more closely, it can be a teaching of socialism. And they impose socialism on biblical justice. Socialism is not biblical justice. But that's a study for another day. I could get off track with that. Just I would encourage you to study justice from the scripture 
Micah 6, 8 tells us, and he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord does require of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is important to the Lord as we see evil taking place, that we stand up and say, no, we need to be a voice for justice. And the Pharisees had lost sight of that, but they also had lost sight of loving God. Now, can't giving be an expression of loving God? Yes. It goes back to our heart. If our heart is right, if our heart is trusting in what Christ has done, so thankful for his provision in our life, and giving is the overflow of that, but also giving can be a box that we check. It's like, well, I'm tithing. I'm giving to the work of the Lord. I set up reoccurring giving, so now I don't need to worry about my relationship with God. It almost can become like this penance type of thing. Well, well, I'm, I'm giving to, to the work of the Lord, but my heart isn't in a place of loving the Lord, isn't in a place of walking in his ways and being committed to justice. In verse 43, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and the greetings in marketplaces. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Number two is woeful pride. Woeful pride. Is instead of loving God, they're loving the praise of people. They want the best seats in the synagogues. They want to be recognized in the place of, of worship. They long for the greetings in the marketplace to be recognized in the marketplace. Oh, there's Pharisee so-and-so. There's lawyer so-and-so. And Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You're, you're hypocrites. You're acting. You're, you're more concerned with the praise of people than being in love with the Lord. And this can creep into our lives. I think our flesh really tends to go in this direction where we want to be recognized. And that has to be nailed to the cross. You know, I'll, I'll confess to you, like when I clean the kitchen and do the dishes, I do really want to be recognized by the family, right? I, I want someone to say, hey, dad, thanks for doing the dishes. And especially if the family has contributed dishes that aren't mine. It's like, I don't, I don't mind doing my dishes, but I'm doing your dishes, right? And so I want you to recognize that I did this for you. And that, that's my flesh wanting that recognition. And Jesus encouraged us on the Sermon on the Mount to, to do things in secret so that our Heavenly Father can reward openly. To really guard towards this. Like, am I, am I doing this for the Lord or am I doing this to be recognized? And again, I think the Pharisees started well. When they began, it wasn't about this recognition. But over time, it shifted and they're living for the praise of people. And our culture seems to be very much enamored with this. And social media plays into this. I'm going to put this out on, on social media. And I don't think social media would be what it is without the like button. That like button is, is the praise of, of men. Oh, how many people liked the post? How many saw the post? How many shared the post? Oh, there was only two likes. Or there was 33 likes and all of those, those type of things. And Paul gives a really powerful verse on this. In Galatians 1, verse 10, he says, For do I now persuade men or God? Am I trying to please men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul says you can't have it both ways. You're either going to be a servant of Christ and long to please him, or you're going to live for the praise of people. In verse 45, then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by these things, teacher, by these things you reproach us also. They're getting the message. They're saying, ouch. Now a lawyer chimes in and says, you're indicting us as well. We have to understand lawyers from the context. What was the law at this time? It was the first five books of the Old Testament. So lawyers would be experts in the law for it to be applied in society. In verse 
46, and he said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Number three, woeful burden. Woeful burden. The lawyers would add these burdens onto God's people that God never intended. And that's what religion does, doesn't it? That's what legalism does. It's not stuff from the scripture that God is telling us to do. It's rules that people have come up that have placed them on us. In generations past, it was taught to believers, oh, you can't go to the movies, or you can't play cards, because that leads to gambling. Well, where's that in the scripture? You know, sometimes as believers, it's like, well, if you're really following Christ, you have to read through your Bible in a year. Like, if you don't read through your Bible in a year, you may not be saved. Like, if you're really saved, the new year's coming, and you better do it in a year, right? It's like, well, where's that in the Bible? We get to read our Bibles because we're saved, but God doesn't give out merit badges like the Boy Scouts because you read through the Bible in a year, right? It's these burdens that get placed on. Well, if you're really serious about Christ, you would fast and pray at least one day a week. I mean, look at the prayer life of Jesus. Now, is it good to pray? Yes, absolutely. But we can put this burden. You know, some believers will say, hey, if you have a Christmas tree at your house, you're in spiritual idolatry. Do you know the background of the history of Christmas trees? They're pagan. You're a pagan. You're worshiping the devil because you got a Christmas tree, right? It's like, well, God knows your heart. I'm, I'm not worshiping some false god because I've got a tree in, in my house, right? But they have these burdens that can get placed. And we need to be careful that we don't lay burdens on people that God hasn't placed on them. And where these lawyers also have gone wrong is they have no intention of lifting any of these burdens themselves. So they'll place a burden on somebody else that they have no intention of, of living under. And that, that's a good thing for us to examine. Am I asking others to do something that I have no intention of doing? And, and I think this is a strong warning to, to pastors and teachers and those who teach the scriptures. Are, are we teaching them accurately? Or are we beginning to lay burdens on God's people that we don't intend to embrace ourselves? Contrast this with the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Verse 47, woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers. For they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Number four is the woeful effect. Where does this lead to with the scribes and the Pharisees? Jesus is saying, you build these tombs, these memorials to prophets, but your fathers were the ones who killed the prophets. You're following in the footsteps of those who killed the prophets from the Old Testament. And a few verses prior, Jesus made mention that the Pharisees themselves were like a tomb that had been covered up, that you accidentally stepped on. What's, what's that all about? Numbers 19 told the Israelites, if you came in contact with a dead body, you'd be unclean. So basically what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees is you have become spiritually dead, that when other people come in contact, they become unclean. Isn't that scary? Here they thought they were following the Lord. Here they thought they were in the right. But in fact, they're in darkness. And when those encounter them, they're inf impacted and influenced in a negative way. Verse 49. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles. And some of them they will kill and persecute. That the blood of the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. Christ is giving them a history lesson saying, this is where Israel rejected the prophets of God, rejected God's message to them, and this generation is rejecting the ultimate prophet, the ultimate messenger, which is God, the Son of Man, God in, in human flesh. From the blood of Abel 
to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Abel was the first prophet to be killed. Cain and Abel, the first family. Didn't go very well. Ended in murder. Why did Cain kill Abel? 1 John 3 tells us the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. It says that the reason that Cain killed Abel because his deeds were wicked and his brothers were righteous. Cain was wicked and his brother was righteous and he hated his brother's righteousness. God did not accept Cain's offering because of his wickedness. God accepted Abel's offering because of his righteousness. And Cain was jealous and chose to kill his brother, the first martyr. How about Zechariah? This is recorded for us in 2 Chronicles 24, where they came right into the temple and killed Zechariah. And Jesus is saying, you guys, you Pharisees and you scribes that look so squeaky clean on the outside are actually plotting my death, plotting the death of, of the Son of Man. Isn't it interesting that it was the religious, that it was the moral majority, that were the ones that were behind the crucifixion of Christ? It wasn't the woman that was caught in adultery, remember? She was broken, exposed in her sin, and Jesus did not condemn her. He says, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. Grace, I do not condemn you. Truth, go your way and sin no more. But these Pharisees that didn't see their need for Christ, that didn't recognize their sin, Jesus confronted in such a powerful way. Verse 52, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourself, and those who were entering in you hindered. They're preventing others from the knowledge of God. How did they take away the knowledge of God? They elevated the traditions of men, the teachings of people, and they devalued and diminished the word of God to where the word of God had no effect and the traditions of men were held as the words of God. That's the exact same thing that's happening today. Unfortunately, in some churches and pulpits throughout America is the teachings of men are being elevated When you really examine them, you go, wait a second, that's not even biblical. It doesn't even line up with scripture, but they're spinning them in such a way where they're attaching God's name to it. You can go out there and find a teaching on biblical sexuality that's not biblical at all. You know what I'm saying? But it will be presented in the name of Jesus. But when you read Genesis 1 and 2 for yourself, there's a clear understanding of what biblical sexuality is. The Bible is being twisted to the point where even universalism is being taught, where it doesn't matter if you believe in Jesus or not. It doesn't matter if you repent of of your sins. Jesus died for the world. So everybody is automatically saved. So if God is loving, how can God send anyone to hell? Well, that might sound good, but it's not biblical, right? And it diminishes the teaching of God's word, and it diminishes the sacrifice of, of Jesus Christ. So knowledge, the key of knowledge, the knowledge of God is hindered. And this is why it's so important to never take anybody else's word for it. Go to the scriptures for yourself. We have access to the word of God. We'll be wise to say, I'm not going to allow my life to be controlled and dictated by the teachings of men. I'm going to go straight to God's word. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I'm going to study it for myself. Don't believe the lie. I think Satan's lying to us that the Bible can't be understood. We tend to think that. Well, I can't study the Bible for myself. Yeah, you can. God wants to communicate to you through his word. The more you study it, the more he unfolds. But this is a scary place to be. These lawyers have come to a place of being a false teacher. They didn't enter into the kingdom of God, but they're also hindering others from entering into the kingdom of God. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say 
that they might accuse him. How do they respond? They get angry, vehemently angry, and they cross-examine Jesus, and they're just waiting and waiting, trying to catch him in his words where they can find enough material to crucify Christ. There's another way that they could have responded, and it's in brokenness, humility, and repentance. Wow, Jesus, you're right. We've really missed it. We're more concerned about our tithing on our herb garden than we are on justice, on loving you. We've gotten everything completely mixed up. We're more concerned about being recognized and praised by people than being in right relationship with you. We've completely diminished your word. But instead they get defensive and they attack Christ. I think of it this way, is here at the church, we've got the front of the stage, right? And the team puts a lot of work into making the stage be the best that, that it can and do, do great, great work, and good lighting and all of those type of things. Now, if I could give you a tour of the backstage, it's nothing like the front stage. It, it's functional, but there's a lot of equipment, instruments. There's actually a baby grand piano right behind these curtains, some drums, some guitars, some cables, and we have an old nasty couch over here. We pray together before the service. We got it off of Craigslist like 12 years ago, and we're still using it, right? But it's dangerously comfortable. When you sit in it, you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it out of this couch, right? <laughs> and in our lives, I think all of us can tend to really focus on what everybody can see. We want it to be squeaky clean. We don't want people to, to think less of us. But then there's the backstage. There's what takes place at home. There's the, the way that we treat our families. It's the reality of who we are online when we're on our devices. Go a little bit deeper and it's the things that we think about in our hearts. And what's Jesus really concerned with? He's concerned with the backstage. That's really where he wants to do work in our lives. Because when our heart is open to the Lord, open and honest with the Lord, and we can receive his forgiveness and his cleansing and his power to be able to change, then he takes care of the rest, doesn't he? For some reason, I think church and being with God's people almost becomes a place where we feel like we have to hide who we really are. If there's one place where we can be honest and transparent, I think it should be with the people of God. Like we do God and we do ourselves a, a disservice to just pretend that we've all got it figured out. Can we just get over that? None of us have got it figured out. And all of us are sinners. And that's why Jesus came. A great way for us to apply this message this morning is to take communion. Communion is about looking back and remembering Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. Not allowing for it to just be a ritual, just a box that we check. Okay, we take communion together one weekend a month, let's, let's rush through this and get on with our day, but to stop and be in remembrance of, of the major thing. What's the major thing? That Jesus died for us, that he rose again, that this is this new covenant. To look forward to his coming, to proclaim his death till he comes, but also to look within. Say, Lord, would you search my heart? And I bet most of us know, I've already been wrestling with this for a little while. The Holy Spirit's already been shining his light on this bitterness or lust or covetousness for some time. And this is the morning to confess. This is the morning to receive his, his grace, to really walk in a relationship with him that's inside out. And to the best that we can, it's going to be a battle. But let's fight against legalism. Let's fight against this idea of saying, well, I've got to read my Bible in order for God to love me. I, I got to come to church on, on Sunday morning. I'm a Christian, and that's what, what Christians do. I've got to give because God tells me to, to give in his word, but to allow us to be in this place of, Jesus, you've forgiven me. You don't love me more if I read my Bible. 
You don't love me less if I don't show up on a Sunday morning. You don't condemn me if I, if I don't tithe. But I want to be in your word because you've loved me and forgiven me. Lord, please protect me from just checking a box and reading my Bible and moving on with my day. But God, I want to I hear from you. I want to be in relationship with you. Lord, I don't just want to come to church on Sunday morning and do the Sunday morning thing. Lord, I want to prepare my heart and I want to come and I want to be ready to sing. I want to be ready to worship. I want to be ready to serve and, and bless, bless others. You know, for married couples, those that are dating, how fun is a date with your spouse when they're totally disconnected, but they're checking the block box? You know, it always breaks my heart to see couples out with time alone together, and they're both on their phones the whole time. It's like, are you guys texting each other? What's going on here? But it can easily happen. You can be at the nicest place and be completely disconnected from each other. But then there's other times in relationship with your spouse or dating where you're like, we don't have any money, but we want to spend time together. Let's go for a walk together. I want to hear about your day. I want to know what's going on in your heart. And what what are you thinking? And the heart is connected. See, legalism and religion can just check the boxes. Just go through, go through the motions. But God's not about that, is he? He's about the heart. He's committed to a real relationship with us and wants us to be in a real relationship with him. So we get to be honest with him. And what's exciting is, as we do this, it's so much better than a religion, it's a, it's a real authentic relationship with Christ. So there's elements that are available here in the front and also ele- elements in the back. You can take one set of cups, the, the crackers on the bottom cup and the juices on the top, and Billy's going to come and lead us in, in worship. And as we come to communion, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, taking communion is not going to be nearly as meaningful as if you trust Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've been in that place of thinking, well, if I go to church, God will love me and forgive me. The only thing that can forgive us of our sins is to trust the gospel. What's the gospel? That Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Say, I need a savior. I cannot save myself through my own works. You know in your heart if you've ever made that decision or not. If you'd like to trust Christ for salvation, inviting him to be the Lord of your life, repenting of sin, as we come to the communion table, Come here to the sides. There'll be a ministry team. If you've got questions, we'd love to try to answer those. There's also a team online. would love to respond to you if you would like to receive Christ as your Savior. Let's stand together. Let's pray, and we'll enter into communion. Jesus, we thank you that you want a real relationship with us, that you're not interested in this religious game. And you see the reality of our hearts. And thank you that you love us and that you have the power to forgive us and change us. And as we take uh, communion, may this be meaningful. Jesus, we remember you. Thank you for your body being broken, your blood being shed. You taking the crown of thorns and being ridiculed and mocked, being punished for our sin. We look forward to your coming. We acknowledge that this world is not all that there is. And also we invite you to search us, to know us. We open up our hearts to you. We want to be real with you this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 